Appreciate it. Sweet. Um, hey, Michael, good to see you. Um, end of the season, Will was asked about his future, and he said that he just, quote, wanted to be appreciated. Um, what has Will meant to the locker room uh, for you for the last six seasons, and are you hoping he'll be back next year? Uh, well, of course, I hope he's back. You know, um, you know, Will is one of the few players on our roster, Mike, as you know, um, that have been here every day that I've been here. And obviously, you look at this six-year progression, what we, we have been able to accomplish, uh, Will Barton is definitely a big part of that. And he's filled many different roles, off the bench, starter, small forward, two guard, uh, point guard at times. Um, so, yes, I would love for Will Barton to be back. Uh, everything he brings to the team that's on the court, off the court, in the locker room from a culture standpoint. Um, and I, it was really kind of interesting for me and great to see, very rewarding for me to see was, you know, uh, end of the season going into the first round against Portland. We had a lot of guys out to injury, key players out to injury with Will Barton being one of those. And, you know, you guys heard me say quite a few times during that first round, guys that weren't playing like Jamal, like PJ, like Will Barton, they were terrific. They were engaged, uh, which I think is a direct reflection of the culture that we have. Um, I've even heard from other coaches uh, of local teams, pro teams in our city that have said they've seen players that they're not able to play on the field. Uh, on the court, on the ice, whatever it may be, they check out. And, and Will and the rest of our players never did that. They were engaged, they were into it, and they were doing whatever they could to support their teammates, uh, to provide energy and positivity. Uh, and, and I love that about Will. So yes, I hope he's back. He means a ton to me personally. He means a ton to this team uh, and everything we've been able to accomplish these last six years. But uh, ultimately, obviously, Will Barton will have to do whatever is best for he and his family. But uh, me personally, I hope he's back here for a long time. Next, we'll go to Matt Moore. Michael, given the context of the season, uh, limited practice time, all the interruptions, the schedule, everything else, the injuries, when you look back on your own performance and trying to assess what you've learned, is there a lot that you can really carry forward from the season or do you mostly want to put it behind you based off of how difficult the last <laughs> year has been? Well, uh, I, I think really uh, interesting question, Matt. And uh, on one hand to be just, you know, completely transparent, you know, uh, I think there are a lot of us, who are, are willing and ready and able to kind of put not just this past season, but last year's 83 days in the bubble behind us uh, and start anew come September, October uh, for the 2021-22 season. Um, th this has been a grind mentally, physically, emotionally. We've talked about that a lot this season. Um, so uh, as hard as it was, though, I think you always have to find ways to reflect upon um, the collective group. What did we do well? What did we not do well? What could we have done better? What did we learn? And then taking that a step further, obviously, and, and I'm still in the middle of this, uh, constantly reflecting on, on me. And, and as the head coach of the Denver Nuggets, um, never being satisfied, understanding that there, there are always ways to get better personally. Uh, what could I have done better to help our team in that Phoenix series? We got swept. Ultimately, that falls on my shoulders. I'm the head coach, regardless of all the, the excuses and injuries, this, that, whatever you want to call it. We got swept. And, and that is never a uh, something that you feel good about. And, and I know I don't. So I, I don't shy away from that responsibility. I, I actually welcome it because that is going to drive me to find ways to help this team be a better team next season. Um, but in today's NBA, I'll say this, Matt, uh, being an NBA head coach 20 years ago was being a head coach. What was really kind of just basketball and, and no disrespect to the coaches 20 years ago because you have a lot of legendary coaches that were phenomenal. Uh, but I think in today's day and age, I think being a head coach in the NBA, uh, you are like, 
like a CEO, you're wearing a lot of hats. Uh, you, you have to be, um, yes, a very um, effective coach, X's and O's game plan. You have to have the ability to relate and communicate with your players, one through 17. Rosters have only gotten bigger. They've gone from 12 to 13 to 15, now 17 players. You have to be able to get along with your front office, your ownership group. Um, and you also have to be aware with what's going on in the world and, and to help lead some young men that maybe not really sure um, where they should be going in the midst of everything that this country is in the middle of still to this day. So uh, I think I'm always trying to look inward and ask myself, where have I failed? Uh, where, ha where have I done a decent job of helping this team? And ultimately with the goal of becoming much better in every area because my hope is still to bring a championship to the city of Denver. Uh, that is what drives me. That is what drives our ownership group, our front office and our players is to ultimately hang a banner in Ball Arena uh, after winning a world championship. Next we'll go to Chris Marlowe. Hey, Coach, I, I wanted to ask you about a couple of your players. Uh, you mentioned P.J. Dozier. Obviously, he was kind of an overlooked loss this season when he couldn't play. I wanted to ask you about his potential uh, for uh, his role next year. And I also wanted to ask you about Zeke Naji. Uh, what kind of potential does Zeke have? We, we saw him sparingly. Uh, sometimes he looked really good. Sometimes he looked, uh, uh, well, okay. What kind of potential these two guys, how do you see their roles next year for your team? Yeah, uh, good to hear from you, Chris. And it was, it was weird not seeing you and Scott Hastings uh, yeah. all year. Uh, missed seeing you, didn't really miss Hastings too much. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that, Coach. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, well, let me start off with PJ. And, and you, you said something that I, I really agree with. Uh, often overlooked, I think. Obviously, when Jamal Murray went down on April 12th, I think, in San Francisco, that was you know, the, the, the biggest uh, topic of discussion regarding the Denver Nuggets and their injuries. Uh, two nights later, Monte Morris, hamstring injury. That was talked about. Will Barton, a week later, back in San Francisco. I think that place is cursed. Side note there. Um, and then uh, probably about a week after Will Barton goes down, PJ goes down. And that was the second time this season, season that we had lost P.J. for an extended period of time. Let's go back to the first injury in Dallas. At that point in the season, Chris, as you know, uh, P.J. was playing phenomenal for us. Uh, and the thing that stands out about P.J. Dozier is the versatility. Uh, here's a young man because of his size, his strength. He can play the one, the two, the three. And there were times this year with, with modern NBA basketball when teams are playing so small and we had injuries, so many injuries throughout the year that PJ actually played some backup four for us. Uh, so you love his versatility. Uh, the, the knock, the question on PJ has always been, can he shoot the ball well enough in the three-point line? And I think going into that Dallas game, I think he was hovering right around 40% from three, which is a phenomenal number, as we all know. Um, but he also showed last year in the bubble the defensive component, a guy that could guard ones, twos, threes, and some fours, a guy that could sit down on the perimeter and contain the basketball against the likes of a Jordan Clarkson, who's a reigning sixth man of the year. Um, so losing P.J., you're losing not just the versatility on offense. He's a tremendous pick-and-roll player. He has the ability to get by his man, break his man down, to get to the rim and finish, and he makes his teammates better. But what we also missed is that the defensive component, uh, the ability to guard one-on-one. -on -one. We don't have uh, just terrific shot blocking on our team. Um, obviously, JaVale McGee provides that. We didn't get that till trade deadline. Um, so PJ, the defensive component as well, was lost. When he gets back healthy, I think PJ has shown enough, uh, and I trust him, I believe in him, I love him, I think he has a chance to be a real impactful player for us. Uh, and we've seen him that uh, do that already, Chris. Regarding Zeke Naji, uh, you know, obviously when you're a young player coming to a team that just made an appearance in the Western Conference Finals, uh, you know it's going to be really hard to get on the court because you're playing on a team that is hopefully competing for an NBA championship. And so Zeke Naji comes in, late first round pick, 
played center at Arizona, uh, led the Pac-12 in double-doubles as a freshman. Um, and when he did get a chance to play, to your point, and he knew he was getting those minutes because of injuries, he was in the rotation, I thought he did a really nice job for us. He showed he has the ability to stretch the floor and knock down threes, which is so important in today's NBA. Uh, he showed that he has the ability to be a really versatile defender. Again, he was a center in college. And this year he's playing probably mostly four, some three, and a little backup five when he got minutes. Um, so I, I think the sky's the limit. And the reason I say that is one thing about Zeke Naji, and I give his mother and father and the whole Naji family credit. Uh, he is one of the hardest workers on our team. Uh, the guy comes to work early, he leaves late, and he never got down when he wasn't playing. Did he like it? Was he frustrated? Of course, but he never allowed it to affect his mindset, his professionalism, his work ethic, and, and the ability to improve every day. Uh, and, and obviously, I think this will be a big summer for Zeke, continuing to work on his perimeter skills, away from the basket, handling, passing, shooting, uh, and having the ability to be one of those defensive players that can guard all over the floor. And I think he has that in him. So uh, very excited about who Zeke Naji is now, but even more excited about the player he's going to become. Next, we'll go to David Aldridge. Michael, how are you, sir? Good. Thank you, David. Uh, hey, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, Coach Unseld on your staff. Obviously, he's, uh, he's going to be a head coach soon. I wonder what you have seen from him the last couple of years um, in terms of development, growth, what he already brought to the table, and uh, what you think he brings, what he will bring to a team if they hire him as head coach? Well, th this is probably going to be my favorite question of the day because, you know, Wes Unseld probably doesn't get nearly enough credit, uh, in my opinion, David, because obviously I know him. He's been on my staff now for six years. We worked in Golden State together and just have long known him being around the NBA for the last 20 years, like Wes has. Um, I've been reaching out to different people with these job openings, trying to really uh, pump him up because he's not a self-promoter. Uh, that is one thing that I love about Wes, but I also uh, wish he was more of a self-promoter at times because he's content to just do his job, do it very well, and allow the results to speak for him, uh, themselves. And unfortunately, you know, you see all these other people being interviewed, having their name plugged and getting jobs. And it seems like Wes is never one of those guys. And I have a feeling that's going to change this summer. And that'll be a huge loss for me, uh, but I wouldn't be more happier for Wes, his wife, Evelyn, their two children. Wes grew up in this game, as you know, David, uh, with his uh, father, who was a legend as a player, coach, front office in Washington. Uh, Wes has a tireless work ethic. He's, he's in the office at 6 a.m. He's the last one to leave. And I'm not just saying that to make him sound good. If you ask anybody around our building, they will agree with that. Uh, he's very educated, great communicator, uh, knows his stuff, and has a unique way of relating to our players. He's a great balance for me. I know this is going to come as a shock to all the members of the local media. I can be a little emotional. I know you're surprised by that. Wes is a great counterbalance for me because he is the exact opposite. And that's one of the reasons I hired him, aside from having a terrific basketball mind. And he's not just a defensive coach. Uh, that's one thing I, I hate about having Wes Unseld as a defensive coordinator, David Adelman as an offensive coordinator. Well, people automatically think that Wes doesn't know offense. And that couldn't be further from the truth. But Wes has a really calm uh, demeanor doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low, uh, very positive. Uh, and, and I know for a fact that when given an opportunity, whether it's in Orlando, whether it's in Washington, one of these other jobs, that he would do a great job developing young players. Uh, he would instill a culture like the one we have here in Denver that's allowed us to improve every single year. Uh, and most importantly, I think the organization uh, would be extremely proud of how Wes and his family would represent the organization in their community. Uh, the guy is a home run. And like I said, I don't want to lose him because uh, he's been that valuable for me in this team, but I also want him to have that opportunity he deserves. He has more than paid his dues 
it's about time somebody gave him the chance to lead their team. Next, we'll go to Joel Rush. Hey, Coach. Good to see you. Um, Tim Connolly was talking last week about, I think in 2016, you and he and Josh kind of got all on the same page in terms of really prioritizing building the culture. And that has obviously produced successful results. But um, in terms of Nikola Jokic over the last year, we heard a lot about him leading by example and working out after games and all of this. Uh, just how important in his development has it been for him to kind of transition from like a building block of that culture into one of the creators of that culture? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, obviously Nicole is coming off of a historic year, uh, first MVP in franchise history uh, and a well-deserved honor, you know, but I, I think sometimes uh, we have short-term memory you know, it was only two two years ago, three years ago, when Nicola was 300 pounds. Um, and obviously he made a commitment at that point in time to really uh, get into the best shape of his life. And he's stayed there. You know, something clicked. You know, uh, you can, everybody in the world can talk to you about something, but until you look yourself in the mirror and make that commitment to be the best version of yourself, it doesn't matter who and what they're saying. Um, so obviously, um, Nicola, since that point in time, has become the embodiment of the culture that I tried to create the first day I got here. And, you know, when I got the job in Sacramento, uh, I said the same thing. My first year was going to be about changing the culture. Did that in Sacramento when I got the job here in Denver. My first thing was taking a team that had just won 30 games. But more importantly, uh, when I got here and I talked to people, uh, it seemed like there was uh, not a winning culture in place. And, and that was priority number one with player development being number two. And, and I think since year one, Joel, to year six, uh, I think we have uh, done a really good job in both those areas of creating a culture, uh, growing that culture, sustaining that culture uh, through year six as well as the player development, making sure that all the players that come through our doors are better players every single season. And, uh, and obviously in a few weeks, a bunch of our young players will be back in our gym as we continue to work on all areas of our player development program. But um, I've said it countless times, you guys already know this. As a head coach, I know how um, fortunate um, I am to have my best player in Nikola Jokic embody the culture that we've tried to create here from day one, being a work team, being a team that trusts in one another, and obviously being a team that is completely selfless, checking your ego at the door, getting over yourself. It's never about the individual. It's always about the group. And uh, obviously Nicola has grown into that. And um, you know, that's, a, that, that's a great luxury to have. Next we'll go to Katie Wingy. Hey, Coach. Great to see you. Um, I I'm going to ask kind of a non-basketball related question here. A, a two-parter, of course, because you know me, I get my money's worth. Um, no worries, Katie. You, you deserve <laughs> it. You've earned it. <laughs> um, in a season that you've talked about being the most strenuous on not only your players' mental health, but your mental health, how does the head coach of the Denver Nuggets decompress and take some time off and get yourself back on track and a little bit more balanced in that regard? And then also, do you have any plans to travel and visit any of your players and spend time with them in their hometowns or home states this summer? Okay. Uh, for the first question, you know, uh, right when the season ended, um, a few days later, my wife, my two daughters and I boarded a plane uh, and flew back to New York to see my parents. Uh, I had not seen my mother and my father in two years. It was, it was literally two years to Father's Day weekend. So. Um, we all know that tomorrow is not promised. My parents are not young, uh, like most of our parents. So that was, for me, priority number one. Uh, you can talk, you can text, you can FaceTime, you can Zoom, but nothing replaces uh, giving your mother and father a hug. Uh, and that was good for me, and my wife, but also really good for my two daughters. Uh, I want them to know my parents. I want them to know and have memories of their grandparents. So that, that was really, uh, important from a personal level for me and my family going to visit my folks back in New York. And that right away kind of 
grounds you and brings you back to reality. Uh, so that was, that was, that was a great uh, five days that we spent with them. Um, I'm actually getting ready to go to Vegas. Uh, my youngest daughter and her um, club volleyball team here, Colorado juniors, they qualify for nationals in Vegas. Uh, so we're going to go out to Vegas and I haven't been able to see her play all year long because of our schedule uh, the rules being only one parent can go watch the, their kids play. So finally having a chance just to go be a family, watch her, support her and her teammates, uh, that, that's going to be something I'm looking forward to as well. Uh, regarding going to see some of our team, uh, our players, um, <laughs> we lose game four to Phoenix. And one of the neatest things about Nikola Jokic is this. Uh, I'm done with my media with you guys, and he's getting ready to come on. And he said, hey, coach, before you leave, you know, uh, I'll come downstairs and we'll have a beer together. <laughs> and um, so we wound up hanging out for like two hours after that game, you know, talking about the season, talking about the summer, talking about his horses, talking about everything. And what I also say is, I don't know and many owners like Josh Cronkey. Josh Cronkey was there with, with me, Nicola, and Josh Cronkey for two hours after getting eliminated in the second round. And uh, when I went home that night, I said, man, we got a, a really unique setup here. Uh, we're all disappointed we lost. No one was happy, uh, especially getting swept on our home court. But to have an owner and an MVP who were just so down to earth and committed to doing whatever it takes to be better and find ways to win a championship, uh, those two hours were uh, so important. But I joked with Nicola, hey, I'm coming over soon. He goes, coach, you can come, but you're not going to find me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's, it's time to give some of our players some space. Uh, you know, we had a long grind, as you know, Katie, in the bubble, uh, a quick two month turnaround, and then right back at it for this year. 72 regular season games, very condensed, and then the 10 postseason games. So um, there's a chance that I'll, I'll wind up doing something later on in the summer. But right now, I, I want all of our players to get away, to decompress, to spend time with their family, their friends, their loved ones. Um, and then we can figure that stuff out. But you know, I, the reason you asked the question is because that's something I have long enjoyed doing. And hopefully with the travel restrictions and COVID, hopefully um, resolving a little bit, I'll be able to get back to doing that because that's something that I enjoy. And I think that's something that allows uh, me to have some of the relationships that I do have. All right, we still got a few more here for you, Coach. We'll go to Harrison Wind. Hey, Coach, good to see you. Uh, okay, I got a question about Nicola as well. Um, hey, Harrison, I got a question for you. What's up? So if I come to your fancy bar down there, are you going to buy me a drink? Oh, of course. We got, we got a table all set up for you already. So let so right. me you know when you're coming. All right, I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> yeah. So let me know. Beers are on us. Um, but but you had spoke a couple times during the playoffs about just the physical and mental fatigue that Nicole was going through unexpectedly, of course, you know, after playing every game and, and shouldering the load that he did. Um, my, my question is, with no Jamal, at least at the beginning of the season, and, and how that puts even more responsibility on Nicola and, and coming off of last season, obviously he wants to play in every game, but have you, you had any initial thoughts on how you might – manage him in terms of minutes and you know, maybe rest next season um, just as of right now? Yeah, no, I think it's a, a really good point. Nicola never likes to sit. We, we, we've talked about that plenty of times. And uh, I think this year, him playing all 72 games played a small part in him winning MVP. Uh, I still think if he would have missed five games, he still should have won MVP. If he would missed 10 games, I don't know, I'm biased. I, I still think he should have won MVP. But next season, you know, uh, after the grind of the bubble this year, the playoffs, um, I, I think we almost have to do it ahead of time, Harris. And what I mean by that is if when the schedule comes out in August, whenever it comes out, look at the schedule ahead of time, see when there's a really uh, – condensed schedule, four and five back-to-backs, and do it ahead of time because now you're taking all the emotion out of it. Because what happens is this. Okay, yeah, we're, we're getting ready to play this game. Maybe that's a game that Nicole can sit. 
And then you lose a game that you're supposed to win. And then you say, well, we can't have Nicola sit. We got to win this game. And you want to avoid that. You know, I, I think taking the emotion out of it, doing it ahead of time and saying, hey, listen, these are the five to 10 games maybe that you might sit because of rest for your body, for your mind, whatever it is. Um, so that's a discussion that we'll continue to have. But uh, your point is a fair one. It's something that we have discussed going into next season. How can we help him? So at the end of the season, you get out of the first round, he's not completely shot. And I felt in that Phoenix series, taking nothing away from them. You know, I, I, I'm not Phoenix. They kicked their ass. They're a very good basketball team. Uh, I always try to give the other team credit, um, win or lose, which certain teams well don't always do. Um, but I, I think Nicola is that important for us. And if we really want to play late into the playoffs, we're, we're going to need him to be able to help us win 16 postseason games. That's the ultimate goal. So uh, we'll, we'll look at that. And, and obviously, other guys are going to have to step up. Jamal goes down on April 12th. We had 18 games to go at that time. We go 13 and five, which is really remarkable. As I mentioned earlier, Harrison, and you know this, it's Jamal, it's Monte, it's Will, it's PJ. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Um, can we replicate that over an 82 game season? Maybe really hard. So we'll need other guys to step up until Jamal gets back. And we'll need Nicola to be playing at an MVP level once again, which um, I anticipate happening. All right, we have time for one more here. We'll end with Brandon Cristal. Hey, Coach, I'm getting on a plane here in California, so I'll make it quick. I asked a question to Tim about not overreacting and changing your personnel. So I know that personnel, obviously, you have input, but that's not, you know, 100% your call. How do you guard against not wanting to change a lot of what you do philosophically and know that what you do works and it just came short this year? I guess, you know, stick to your guns, I guess, is the question. Yeah, I mean, I, coming in and out a little bit, but I think I got the gist of your question, Brandon. Um, I think you always have to, we talked earlier about taking some time to self-reflect on, on what we can do better, what I can do better. Um, and, and I think long gone are the days of, this is my philosophy and I'm sticking to it. Uh, the game is always changing. And if you're not willing to change with the game, uh, the game will pass you by. I firmly believe that. Uh, I am the son of an NBA coach. I'm the son of a coach, rather, a teacher. And the game has changed dramatically since my father was coaching with the New York Knicks on the UV Brown, under Chuck Daly and the Bad Boys, under Jeff Van Gunn with the New York Knicks, to 2021. The game is always changing. And ideally, you'd like to be ahead of those changes, be ahead of the curve. Um, but I think we always take time during the off season to look at ways that we can change. And we've changed in my six years. We have adjusted and changed our philosophy uh, in different areas of the game uh, that have helped us. And obviously when you're a bottom five defensive team and last in three point defense a few years ago, and then you morph into the number one three point defensive team, that wasn't luck, that wasn't happenstance. That was, we're going to make these changes. So you take a really honest look at who you are and you, you understand, okay, we have to be better in these areas. We failed. Regular season, we were a top six offense. I think we were 11th in defense. And in the playoffs, our defense was, was awful. And we got away with it against Portland because we were able to score at a high rate against Phoenix, a much better defensive team. Our offense wasn't there. We couldn't make shots. We barely scored the ball. And we couldn't get any stop. So, uh, yeah, we, we have to take a long, hard look at who we are, what we do, and what we can be better at and how we can be better at those things so we don't repeat that next year. And that's something I think we've done every year. And that's why we've been one of the few teams that's found a way to really continue to improve and advance every year. Now, I'm sure there are people out there saying, well, you didn't get back to Western Conference Finals. This year was a failure. Uh, I would not agree with that. Uh, not at all, because every season is different. Every season bring, brings its own trials and tribulations. So uh, this year, we didn't make it to the Western Conference Finals, but everything that we were facing and thro was thrown at us, we did the best to our abilities, and hopefully next year we can learn from this experience and be better next season. 
All right, Coach, that'll do it. We appreciate you taking the time today. All right, guys. Appreciate everybody. Have a great summer.